And uh, good afternoon. My name is Angus Winchester. I'm the Education Director for BCB Brooklyn, and I'm moderating today's presentation. So welcome to the second part of BCB's ongoing engagement with and commitment to our industry during these troubled times. Every Monday at 4 p.m. Eastern, we'll be bringing some of the high quality bar and hospitality education that we're known for, split between some of the highest rated sessions from last year's event, and also some extra sessions selected from this year's submissions. Now, I could not be more happy to kick off this series with a session I championed last year due to my fascination with Sipuru, but unfortunately could not actually attend due to my busy on-site schedule as education director, The Spirits of Greece, run by Johnny Livanos. I know he's going to give you his intro and bio, uh, because that's the only bit of the se session I saw last year, but I'll give you, just deal with some housekeeping issues. Firstly, we are recording today's webinar and a link will be sent to you tomorrow. If you're having difficulty hearing us today and are listening through your computer, please check that your speaker volume is turned up or message us using that chat box located on the right side of your screen. Also, feel free to ask questions through the same chat box. We'll review throughout the presentation and try to have a designated time for Q&A towards the end of the webinar. And now, Johnny, take it away. All right. Thank you, Angus, for the introduction. Hello, everybody. Thank you all for joining us today. I uh, hope you're all doing well, staying healthy, and thank you for spending your Monday afternoon to talk about something that is so near and dear to me, uh, Greek spirits. Um, so just in today's presentation, I'm going to spend a little bit of time sharing with you what something I'm super passionate about, uh, and it's a, a subject that not too many people are very familiar with outside the Greek community. Uh, so without further ado, I'm going to start the presentation um, and just go through the spirits of Greece. All righty, one moment. All right. So who am I? Well, I'm Johnny Lovanos. <laughs> uh, so I come from a Greek restaurant family, um, like many Greek people, <laughs> they are in the restaurant business. Um, so I've been working in Greek restaurants for most of my professional life in the food and beverage industry. Um, most recently, I was opening manager uh, at my family's restaurant, Usia, which is in Manhattan, um, which focuses in on Greek food, Greek spirits, cocktails, and wine. Uh, I also recently took a, a new position with Diamond Wine Importers, um, so I'd be working with a lot more with Greek wine and spirits in general. And then I have a little uh, something else to show, share with you at the end about a new project I've been starting on. I, I mentioned it at last year's BCB presentation for you, for those of you who were able to see it. Uh, but in this class, we're going to go over Greek spirits 101. So basically talking about history of alcohol in Greece, very brief. I'm not a historian, but I'm going to do my best to share that with you. Uh, we'll talk about Tsipuro, which is the... Uh, one of the iconic, most important spirits in Greece. Mastika, which is one of the probably right now becoming the most important spirit, Greek spirit outside of Greece, like especially in the United States with a lot of great brands uh, on the market. Uzo, Metaxa, Rakomolo, and Tentura. Um, I'll also briefly talk about how each spirit could be used in cocktails and modern uses. And then I'll talk a little bit about uh, what, I, what I like to call the Greek cocktail renaissance that's going on in Greece at the moment. So that's a picture of me uh, with uh, my collection of spirits at Usia in the bar. Um, so you can see a bunch of great brands that I have there. All right, so a little bit of history about Greece. So alcohol has been in a really important part of history in Greece since about 6,500 years ago. Um, you know, in Greece, they have a pretty awesome relationship with wine, spirits. It's a part of their culture. It's a part of who they are. You know, wine is looked looked at as a, as a food product. It's not necessarily looked at as a, as alcohol, as like a way to get drunk. And it's because of the way it's kind of transitioned throughout their history. Um, in in the 1700 in the 1700 BC, um, what, the grapes came from the Levant area in Egypt and kind of spread out throughout the Hellenic Peninsula and became a lot more commonplace. Uh, people would drink wine warm, diluted, chilled, plain, and also mix it with spices. So I like to call that maybe some of the first cocktails that we know. Um, and drinking alcohol has become a very important part and it's considered an integral part of Hellenic culture. Uh, and their societies in, in ancient times were known for being the culture of, of alcohol, especially for their love for the Greek god Dionysus, which is over here on the right side. Uh, he was the god of uh, grape harvest, winemaking, love, ecstasy, uh, sex, rit ritual madness, and theater. Uh, so he's a fun god to worship, for sure. Uh, and because of his, his worshipers, alcohol really took an important uh, part of the culture. 
Um, I'd just like to mention that, so wine making is of course integral to the Greek uh, culture, but distilling, especially recently, uh, has become extremely important. So I have a picture here on the right. I was at the uh, Athens Bar Show this past year, and this is just an example of all the dozens of different brands that are all on the market in Greece. Um, so distillation first became mentioned in, by Aristotle, and he was talking about how seawater could be made potable by boiling it and capturing the vapors. Um, then the Ottoman Empire is are the people who brought distilling to Greece and in in Europe in the early 14th century. Um, and Greece, distilling, distilling in Greece pretty much started with the Orthodox monks. I feel like monks all over the world get a lot of credit for bringing alcoholic products to the world. We have the Trappist monks making beer. And then in Greece, you have the Mount Athos monks that created Thess uh, Tsiporo in the mountains of Thessaly. Um, so they were always avid winemakers in that area. And they decided to change things up and to start and try try their hands in distilling. Um, and we'll talk a little bit more about Tsiporo in a little bit. Um, just want a quick note, it's important to note that distillers in Greece are all small businesses, except for you know a couple big brands. Um, many of these producers are small family-owned companies and they're working their butts off to keep traditions alive and to really pay homage to the land, to their history, to their ancestors by bringing in new brands and new products onto the market. Um, so most of the Greek spirits are consumed by Greeks in and outside of Greece. And it wasn't until the last like maybe five to 10 years that there's been much of a demand of these spirits outside of Greece. Um, but things are slowly changing because people are starting to recognize the beauty and diversity of this category. That's kind of what, I'm, what I've been making one of my own missions. It's been really awesome to share the diverse beauty of Greece and its spirits. Uh, so I hope you all have a chance to try some of the things we talk about today, whether it's at a once we're able to go back into the world and to enjoy uh, restaurants and bars, or maybe visit a local liquor store and, and try, try your hand on something, as they're starting to become definitely more readily available. All right, so the main spirits that we'll be talking about are Tsiporo, Mastika, Uzo, um, Metaxa, which is a traditional Greek uh, specialty liqueur, Rakomolo, Tentura, and then a new product that's becoming part of the gin, uh, the spirits of Greece is gin. First, we will talk about Tsipuro, because Tsipuro, in my opinion, is the most important spirit in Greece. So Tsipuro, it is a pumice brandy made by distilling the leftover skins and stems uh, from winemaking. Um, it traditionally comes in two different ways, with anise or without anise. Um, so when, when they're distilling it without anise, it's going to be basically just like a, like similar to grappa, uh, just grape brandy, or they also oftentimes will mix a lot of different botanicals in there to create their own secret recipes. And this is the great grandfather of what we know as ouzo, which we'll talk about a little bit later today. So tipuro has been produced locally and in the homes of, of Greeks for centuries. Um, and, un, un, and until the 1980s, it was basically an underground spirit, and it still is today. Um, it's, um, used to be kind of make a moonshine in a way. So basically, you know, spirit production in Greece is a highly regulated thing by the government. So people have been making this in their homes. Um, Greeks are also a very agricultural based country. And there's a lot of farmers and small winemakers out there that uh, would make tsiporo in their basements they, or in their garages, for example, after they go and sell their wine uh, or grapes to winemakers around the country, they would keep a little bit of the pumice for themselves and that's what they would drink. So that gave it the, the status of being called the poor man's wine. Um, in 2006, Tsipuro achieved a great milestone and it finally it was given PDO status in the EU. So now Tsipuro is a protected designation of origin. It could only be, only be produced in Greece with indigenous Greek varietals. Um, so we'll talk a little bit about, oh, a couple of notes I wanted to mention before we go into this. Um, so yeah, like I said, how it was illegal to produce in the 1980s and how it's mainly small for, small producers. I just found a really interesting statistic that there is over 51,000 license holders in Greece to produce Tsipuro. But out of that 51,000, 47,000 are only producing a, a, batches of 150 liters or less. So that's just how small, how, how it's how commonplace it is. And people are making a lot of little batches in their home. So, you know, we're having a craft, craft spirit movement across the world but it's fun to think how in Greece people have been making these kind of spirits in their homes and their villages in their in their for centuries. 
All right, so how is Tipero made? So like I said, it is derived from pumice, um, but it has to be with indigenous Greek varieties. So some varieties could include things like Muscat of Limnos, Mosco Filero, Sideritis, Aioritico, Asirtico. So there's, they use both red and white varieties there, but there's definitely more of a emphasis on the aromatic varieties. Um, those, that's, what, that's what gives Cipero for me is such a cool product. When you compare it to things like the Grappa, which to me has a very, like it's robust and bold, Cipero is always tends to be pretty uh, aromatic, light, and delicate. It's traditionally, I have a picture on the bottom of here of a traditional pot still that is used to make uh, Cipro. And that's probably on the larger side of what a, uh, a still looks like in Greece. They, a lot of times they're even smaller than that. As I said, they're, they're made in people's homes or in basements. Um, and then to anis or not to anis. So this is all based on people's preferences. Um, you could have you could be distilling it with herbs and botanicals. And there's another great Cipro on the market right now from uh, from a collection of bartenders called Opurist, and they're distilling it with uh, with onions, fennel seed, uh, tomato, olives, lots of different unique botanicals that are that are local, that are indigenous to their to their areas. And you're seeing a lot more people start to use it in in, in mixing. Uh, Johnny, um, just, a, yeah. just a quick question to come in. What's the alcohol percentage of it? Similar to Grappa? What sort of what are the range? It varies. I mean, out? usually it's around 40% minimum. Um, I mean, 40% is the minimum for Tsipuro, but I, I say their average is going to be around 45%. Um, I have one here. I'm going to share. I'm going to share my screen. Can you see me now? Yeah. All right. So this is a great. This one is a Moscow filero based Tsipuro called uh, Ipsicaminos, which has a 44% uh, ABV. So I'd, I'd say between 42 to 50, even sometimes higher. But since they only use pot stills, it's kind of harder to go above that. Okay, but there isn't a legal minimum, legal maximum. A forty percent, though, is the is the minimum. Yeah. Thanks. You're welcome. Alrighty. So I have a little bit in my glass that I'm gonna I'm gonna taste because you know I'm gonna taste for you guys. And if you all have some Cipro, pour some out. Um, so like I said, I showed you in the a video. I'm drinking the Ipsi Caminos Mosco Filero from a Verino Distillery, which is located in the Peloponnese area. Um, and this one has this classic. You know, this classic floral notes that are indicative of the variety. Mosco Filero is a grape that is extremely floral. Uh, the name in Greek literally means the smell of flowers. So you get a lot of those aromas on here, but it's super smooth. You know, when people think of grape distillates, like, like from pumice, I think they have a connotation of being a little bit kind of a strong, um, slight burn to it. But what I love about what Tsiporos is they tend to have this, free, they're really lighter than you'd expect and really pleasant. Um, and I, I, didn't, I kind of skipped over it about um, how it's drunk in Greece. But in Greece, people drink this. It's, the, it's, it's kind of the start of the night and the end of the night. If you're going to someone's house, they have a bottle. It's usually in a non-labeled plastic bottle. They'll put it on the table. They'll pour you a shot and well, as a welcoming gift. Um, and it's a way to accompany a dinner. It, oftentimes in Greece, the, you know, especially with the younger kids, they'll go to a pub to watch some music. Have it, they'll, they'll buy a little carafe of tipuro and they'll slowly sip it while eating some snacks. Um, so that's how it's traditionally consumed. It's definitely an accompaniment to food, a festive spirit. It kind of marks the harvest. It marks the, the celebration and the appreciation of life and grapes and the, and the bounty. Um, but now you're starting to see people using it in a lot of different ways. So it's a very aromatic spirit, like I said. Um, so it's the easiest way to describe it is grappa, but I make an argument that it's more like the Greek pisco. Um, so where grappa, it's strictly the pumice, the skins of the of the grape go into making the the spirit. With pisco and and then cipro too, you do add back a little bit of wine or the actual juice to give it that more aromatic, rounder quality. Um, that part, I, as I believe, isn't necessarily regulated. Where as are some spirits, they they dict some some other categories of spirits, they dictate how much grape uh, wine you could add back, but in, it's pretty loose with Tsipuro. Um, and with cocktails, I love to use Tsipuro in place of aromatic spirits. So, you know, if you have a recipe that calls for gin or maybe uh, mezcal or tequila, I like to try it with, with Tsipuro. And you, it works really, really well um, like in a pisco sour sort of style drink or a Tsipuro sour. Um, also in Greece, they're making some fantastic uh, 
barrel aged Tsipuros, which is def not necessarily traditional. Traditionally, it's a clear spirit, um, but they're starting to add, do some more barrel aged stuff, four or five years aged, and those are fantastic as an after dinner drink. Um, definitely could compete with brandies from all over the world. Um, before we go on to the next spirit, were there any questions about uh, Tsipuro, uh, Angus? No, just the, the alcohol content, and I was going to ask whether it was aged or not. Uh, what I mean, yeah, you say it's, it's, being aged? Traditionally, it's not aged. I'm sorry. What What are people? What sort of barrels are people using uh, to age it now? So they definitely use uh, oak barrels, and but one type of barrel that's become popular in Greece is our, our limousine casks. Um, so you're seeing some limousine barrels used. Um, Metoxa brandy kind of started that trend. They aged their brandies in limousine casks. So you are, I, I have seen a lot of producers use that as well. Uh, acacia barrels and oak. Cool. Okay. Thanks a lot, mate. You're welcome. All right. So we had a quick poll before we continue. If you want to throw it up there, a uh, question for everyone in the audience. Um, how many people have had Uzo? Just trying to get a little bit of engagement. Um, so if you take a second, if I may, a few seconds for everyone to fill out the question that's going to pop up on your screen. And can I, let me know when I could continue. Uh, I don't see the answers here on my side. There we go. So it says the poll's in progress at the moment. So the question is on a scale of one to five, how much do you like Uzo? One, hate it. Two, don't like it that much. Three, either hate it nor love it. Four, I like it. Five, Opa, I love it. <laughs> but this was the, that was the second question, I believe, or I could, I could skip to Uzo, that's no problem. I'll skip yeah, to Uzo now. You'd asked about Uzo, we put the sticker up to start off with, but uh, now we gave you the Uzo question. because okay. was... There we go. Uh, and the results? 3% hate it, 16% don't like it that much, 19% are indifferent, 32% like it, and 29% love it. So as okay. I say, we've got a 51% are fans. All right, cool, that's good. Well, uh, hopefully we'll get the other 50% to uh, to become, to convert over to it. Uh, mm -hmm. So I'm gonna, okay, I'm gonna skip ahead to Uzo, and I'm gonna talk a little bit about why I think maybe some people have problems with Uzo as we go through this. Uh, I love Uzo, um, and I feel like a lot of people who hate it have maybe have just drank it wrong. Well, anyway, before we talk about Uzo, what is Uzo? All right, so Uzo is a anise flavored spirit uh, that is similar to Sambuca, Pastis, or Arak, which is from Lebanon. Um, so the production of Uzo is something that spiked in the 19th century, and it's kind of become a part of Greek identity. Um, the, the, in history, the Uzo is related to Tsipro, that is flavored with anise, but the main difference between Tsipro that is flavored with anise and ouzo is that ouzo is derived from a uh, neutral spirit. Um, so the base of ouzo has to be 95, 96% rectified spirit that comes from either uh, neutral grain or from molasses. And then they use that and they mix it with botanicals, just like how you would make maybe like a gin, for example. So you take, for the distillation, you, 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 you start one distillation with all the botanicals. Uh, the botanicals could include anise, star anise, fennel seed are the main ones, and then other botanicals depending on the, on the recipe of the producer. Uh, so the main botanicals, other botanicals besides the ones I mentioned could be mastica, which we'll talk about in a little bit, uh, cardamom, cinnamon, coriander, cloves, chamomile, and elderflower. So after the first distillation with the botanicals, the ouzo distiller will then uh, put it through a second distillation without botanicals to kind of smooth it out. And then they dilute it with water uh, to the desired ABV, and they sometimes uh, add sugar. Um, one of the reasons why I love ouzo is because it comes from the island of Lesbos, which is where my ancestors come from. Uh, my grandfather comes from a village very close to Plomari, which is the birthplace of ouzo. And actually, the, the biggest brand of ouzo in Greece is called Plomari, named after, named after um, uh, the village. Um, one thing I just wanted to demonstrate very quickly, I'm going to stop sharing the application, and you could all see my face again. Uh, I'm going to share with you what they call the ouzo effect. So one reason why I think you don't like ouzo, or some people might not look at ouzo, is because someone in your life may have given it to you in a sh as a shot. And I blame a lot of Greek diners across America for this. 
where they might give a bottle of ouzo on the table, pour everybody a shot, and they say, opa, and then they make you all chug it. But ouzo is very harsh on its own. And in Greece, you never drink it neat. It is always accompanied by, like in the picture, uh, the previous slide, with ice, and with usually they also give some water as well. And you, that's to open up, the, the open it up. It allows the, the botanicals to really bloom and blossom. It makes it a much more aromatic and pleasant experience. I'm gonna quickly show you all the ouzo effect here. Um, I'm gonna, nothing like drinking ouzo at four in the afternoon on Monday. Uh, and you can tell, as, as, it, as it dilutes, it com turns completely white in the glass. And what is basically happening is this, there's oil in the, um, the anise, it's called anethole, which becomes emulsified in the water. Uh, and this happens with a lot of anise-based spirits. Like it happens the same thing with pastis, uh, sambuca. It's just that oil content in the ouzo becomes emulsified and becomes cloudy. So I'm gonna go for a sip while I talk about the rest. Let me get back to the slideshow, one moment. Okay, so I wrote a poem about Uzo not too long ago as I was in quarantine dreaming about it. Uh, it's a drink for Mezedes, an accompaniment to salty snacks by the sea. Take me back to the beach with your sweet and his smell. Oh, Uzo, how I miss you. <laughs> um, so on the bottom there, you just have a picture of a classic Greek table, all right? So you hardly are gonna be drinking Uzo on its own unless you're giving a webinar uh, to people <laughs> right now during quarantine. Otherwise, you would be having a lot of different snacks to accompany the, 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 the drink. Um, mainly salty snacks like uh, sardines, olives, um, maybe some tzatziki with some pita bread. And it's also a social beverage. Um, you know, you people, you always you don't really buy a glass of ouzo at a restaurant in Greece. You'll be buying a bottle of ouzo. And in Greece, uh, I have these little mini bottles. In Greece, they have, they often have little bottles like this. So at a restaurant, you could buy a five, uh, a 50 ml bottle. Uh, you could buy a 100 ml bottle. They have all different sizes because you're kind of you have the bottle with you. At, with your friends and you're gonna drink it together over the course of your meal. Uh, so that's one thing that I, I, I think to really experience the, the beauty of Uzo, you have to do it the real Greek way. And there aren't that many places that are doing it that way here in America or wherever you're watching it outside of Greece. Uh, so try that next time you go to a Greek restaurant that has Uzo, have it with some friends, drink it slowly over the course of the night, Make sure you have a bunch of different mezedes or snack. Mezedes is kind of like the Greek tapas or there's little snacks, little bites, and, then, and drink it over the course of a night. And in Greece, you know, we're not really in a rush when you're there. People are in a much more slow pace style. And the, 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 I feel like the ouzo kind of slows its life down. It's there's something also about the anise in there. It cools your body down. It's refreshing. Um, so even though it is a strong spirit, like the one I'm drinking right now, uh, it's from Apostolagma. It's 59% alcohol. So you don't, you really don't want to drink this neat. You definitely want to have it diluted. But that having such a high ABV to begin with allows the flavors to really still pop even when it's diluted with some ice and water. So you'd have it uh, as a, not so much as an aperitivo or a digestive, but almost alongside the food itself. Exactly. Yeah. I feel like I feel like in America and in lots of other parts of the world. It's not common to have a spirit as an accompaniment to a meal, right? It's either you either have a cocktail, that's it, it could be an accompaniment to a meal, or you have it as a DGC for aperitif. Uh, and a lot of the world is, is like that. But in Greece, Uzo with Tsiporo, you have that with your meal. It's meant to be paired with food uh, as an accompaniment to food. And it also it also works well with the Greek style of the family style eating. You know, in, in Greece, it's not very common for you to order an appetizer, entree, and dessert. You're getting a bunch of stuff for the table. Everybody's sharing, and and, and ouzo is a, is one of the few spirits that could go with everything on the table. It's Greek Greek food. Yeah. Cool. Um, okay, I'll go back to the screen here. Uh, so yeah, definitely next time you're trying ouzo, please try it with some water and some ice. Don't take shots of it because then you're gonna you're gonna ruin it for. <laughs> you might get scarred and you won't be able, you won't want to go back to it. Um, so like I said, always with ice and water. I'm gonna try to hammer that point home. Um, 
other notable producers, so I told you we were drinking the Apos de Lagma here, Stupakis, Uzo 12, Barbayanis, and Plomari are other uh, main producers. Um, I'm going to go backwards now to Mastija because we accidentally skipped over that. Okay. So the next spirit I want to talk about is Mastija. Um, so before we talk about the Mastica liqueur, it's important to talk about the Mastic resin. So in the top of the picture, you see the, uh, the Mastic resin there. So this is a, basically a tree sap that comes from the trees that only grow on the island of Chios. So on the map, Chios is all the way in the eastern side of Greece, and it's the only place in the world that produces this resin. Um, Fun fact, the word in English masticate or Spanish masticar comes from the Greek mastica because this was the original chewing gum. It, uh, it's a natural phenomenon. As you chew this product, it doesn't break down. It actually becomes exactly exact kind of texture uh, as a chewing gum. Um, in the fifth century, century, Hippocrates taught about the healing properties of mastica and how it aids in digestion and also as a breath freshener. So I like to think back in the day before they had toothpaste and toothbrushes and oral hygiene, mastic, mastica was the way for them to achieve clean teeth. Um, the families and villages in Chios became well known all over the world for these crying trees uh, because it became very lucrative and very well known all around the world during this, the ancient times. Um, in the, during the Roman Empire, uh, mastica was then added to wine to create remedies as medicine. So I, we could argue that that was the first mastica liqueur. And then um, in the Byzantine era, um, the emperor monopolized the production of mastica and it was exported all over the world. It became very popular in, in terms of like the spice trades across the Middle East, Europe and parts of Asia Minor. Um, and then during the Ottoman rule, many Greeks were enslaved uh, all over Greece, except the island of Chios was spared because of its importance of mastic production. And during this time, mastic became worth its weight in gold. So that's just to kind of to provide a little bit of historical context about the actual mastic resin, mastica resin there, um, which brings us into the mastica liqueur. So once the mastic resin is harvested, I have a, a couple pictures here you can see. First, they score the trees with a little knife. The tears slowly drip off the tree until they fall into the sand where they are then dried. And then they are cleaned by hand. Um, to make the liqueur, they then take the mastic resin. Uh, it's typically made with a neutral grain spirit or a sugar beet molasses based spirit uh, and distilled together. Um, well, they, they macerate it and then distill it. Um, and it's, that's it, sugar, water, alcohol, and then the mastica are then, that's all the ingredients for the mastica liqueurs. The mastic flavor, the mastica flavor is so unique. It's kind of hard to describe it um, if you never had it before. It, the flavor, what I love about giving this to people is that I, I, everyone, when they taste it, they, they have a different perception of it. Um, some people might say it tastes like anise. Other people, like myself, I feel like it has a very nice herbal, earthy, vegetal notes. To me, every time I taste it or smell it, it reminds me of the flavor. It reminds me of the aroma of when you're uh, peeling a carrot, like that fresh, like that fresh uh, vegetal aroma or it kind of also reminds me of taking like a tree a tree branch and if you crack a freshly tree tree branch that smell there so it's very earthy but beautiful at the same time um, in Greece this is typically consumed as a digestif uh, so it's something you'd have at the end of your meal um, it's often conserved neat on the rocks or oftentimes cold um, I like to keep a bottle in the freezer for giving people neat uh, neat shots of this it is sweet, so I like to, and if you're serving this in your bar or restaurant, I definitely recommend serving it um, after dinner. And, and suggest, I like to recommend it for people who are looking for an after dinner drink, but maybe they don't like the bitterness of, an, of Italian Amaro or a, of just bitterness of Amaro in general, but they still want something that is gonna, you know, kind of relax the stomach. And that's, that's, that's Mastica right there. Um, actually the Mastica resin, before the liqueur, it was always used as a as a way to kind of help with gastrointestinal problems and digestion, like a digestive aid. And all those medicinal properties, they kind of are intact in the liquor form. Uh, so it it's it works wonders after a big meal. Trust me, <laughs> especially a big Greek meal, because there's no such thing as a small Greek meal. One shot of mastica is, is, does a lot to settle the stomach, kind of relax and aid in digestion. 
uh, refresh your palate and, and, and so, so, yeah, so I mean, I will add up when I was, when I've been in Greece and at the end of meals, often restaurants would bring over like a small chill bottle of Mastika and often one of sort of limoncello or similar. Yeah. Uh, is Mastika always the question somebody had? Is Mastika syrupy? I mean, is it quite thick and viscous, or is it? It depends spiritual? on the on the brand. I, it, when it's if you have it in the freezer, if it's a cold Mastika, uh, it, it has a viscosity for sure. Um, I'm drinking some right now. Uh, it has a slight viscous viscosity to it, but it shouldn't be syrupy at all. Um, I mean, it is sweet for sure. Uh, and depending on the brands you get, they range in, in sweetness. Um, but I feel like it's definitely syrupy when you have it cold out of the freezer. You could almost use it, it pours like syrup into the glass. But at room temperature, it's just a slight viscosity, not not too intense. Yeah. yeah. OK. Um, there's a lot of great producers right uh, right now. And what I love about Mastika is that it's probably the fastest growing Greek spirit outside of Greece. We have great products like Verino, Skinos is by far, Skinos is the biggest uh, producer of Mastika, Cleos, which is a great Mastika, it's a new brand uh, by Greek American, uh, Roots is another, one, another fantastic product. So there's a lot of amazing brands out there that are starting to take Mastika to the next level because they're the ones that are really pushing to see Greek spirits in cocktails. Um, and Mastika is one of those cocktails, one of those spirits that does amazing in a cocktail. Um, I love to pair it with uh, gin or mezcal, vodka, tequila. It works well with a lot of different spirits, but to me, like especially mezcal, the earthiness of the mastica pairs with that, you know, that minerality and earthiness and smokiness of the mezcal so well. Um, so you could use it as an after dinner drink. You could use it as a modifier in cocktails. You could also use it as the base beer in a cocktail as well. Because while it is sweet, it's not overly sweet to the point where it makes a drink cloying. Um, in cocktails. You know, definitely when you're using it, I love to sometimes use it in, in, in replace of a sweetener or any cocktail where I'm using mastica, I might increase the mastica and then not use any simple syrup at all um, as a way just to bring more flavor and oomph to a cocktail and really give it a unique flavor. This yeah, is a Valentine's I, Day cocktail we did not too long ago at, at my family's restaurant, Usia. I've seen people subbing it in where they use things like St. Germain, for example. Yeah, for yeah. sure. Yeah, that's a great that's a great substitute. Yeah, I mean, uh, Skinos. Uh, I mean, sorry, Mastika has a a little bit higher alcohol content than Saint Germain, I believe. Um, but it, it's it's kind of similar in terms of its sweetness level and viscosity. Uh, Saint Germain has a little bit of like a good acidity to it, where Mastika is more kind of like has like a basic like a base. There's no, it's not really acidic. It's not bitter. It's right in the middle, which is what I love about it because it doesn't. It, in terms of making a and working with balancing flavors in a drink, it's something that you kind of add on top. It, it's not. It's very easy to balance with other ingredients, which is something I, I find I find really cool. But yeah, I mean, I, I've made a. You could try it in like um, in, instead of Saint Germain for sure. I also like to play with it instead of Maraschino liqueur. Um, I made. I recently made a last word. Um, with pisco, mastica, and green chartreuse, and it, it was it was perfect because you know it, I feel like in terms of sweetness and viscosity, maraschino was another great example or comparison to it. Indeed, and mastica is also, should we say, I mean, it's the gum is used as a flavoring for other food products. Yes? Oh yeah, totally. So mastica is used for lots of different things. You're using it for they're using it for cosmetic products. Uh, they're using it for medicine. It's used for chewing gum. Uh, and then in Greece, they use it, they'll pulverize the mastica and turn it into a powder. And they'll, they'll use that in terms of in baking. So if you ever had a Greek tureki bread, which is popular around Easter time. So I just ate a, my fair share of a loaf recently. Not that we had East Greek Easter, it was a few weeks ago. Um, they can use it in baking and also in food for sure. Cool, okay, great. Cool. Yeah, I definitely encourage you to use Mastika. Out of all the spirits we're talking about, I feel like this is something you can easily find at a liquor store. Um, there's a variety of brands out there. Um, so definitely check it out. Indeed, and Effie's doing great stuff with Cleos as well. I mean, first yeah. family, first female. Yeah, yeah, um, she's, she's a first, brand. first Greek female brand owner. Uh, she's based in um, she's based in Boston, but she, just, she, she launched, I believe, last year or two years ago, um, doing a nice job there. Yeah, cool. Alrighty, so you can't really talk about Greek spirits without talking about Metaxa. And Metaxa is one of the most important Greek brands. It's definitely one of the most oldest and most iconic brands in Greece. 
Um, let me just pull up my notes one second. Okay. So it was founded in 1988. So it is, it is literally the old, sorry, 1888. So it is literally the oldest, one of the oldest brands in Greece. And it's actually one of only two brands in Greece to survive World War One, World War Two, and the economic crisis in 2008. Uh, and the only other brand was George Karolias, which is a tobacco brand. So uh, I think it's it's kind of funny. B booze and, and and cigarettes are they they had a long-lasting recession-proof um, products of Greece uh, and maybe in the world. So keep note for what we're going through right now. Um, so it's, for most of Metoxa's history, it was called a brandy, but it is a little bit mis mis uh, misleading to call it um, a, a brandy because it's really an infused and sweet in the brandy spirit. Um, so. How does how was how was Metaxa started? So it starts off as a brandy, then they age it in barrels with Muscatosamos, which is a Greek dessert wine, and they infuse it with a variety of botanicals. So, unlike brandy, which is just grape grapes distilled and aged, that's it. That's all it can be to be considered brandy. Metaxa they're adding a lot more ingredients to it. So they're like all special Greek things. They're always going to have a secret recipe. So we don't know all the botanicals that are in Metaxa, but we do know that they use rose petals, apricots, and orange blossom. Um, so when you taste Metaxa, you're going to definitely get those characteristics. Um, very floral, aromatic, and a slight sweetness, but they're not sweetening it with sugar. It's, it's being sweetened with dessert wine. So it's not a cloying sweet. It's almost, it's like a dessert wine level of sweetness. So it's still, you know, that they're still coming at around 40% alcohol. So you're having the body of, of, of a brandy, but with the softness of an, of a, of a, of a liqueur, but not as sweet as liqueur, if that makes sense. So they have a lot of different, uh, they have a big line extension, the five star, seven star, 12 star, and the grand fine. Uh, each of the stars represents how many years they're aged. Um, like I mentioned, they was sold as a cognac. In Greece, they'd say, oh, I'm drinking cognac, here's a mataxa. Uh, but that's, they don't do that anymore because that's breaking the rules. Um, and I, I, I think that Greece, Greeks and, and marketing kind of they made some mistakes in its in their history. I, I you know they might have always wanted to compare themselves to French brandy or Italian grappa, but they sometimes maybe miss that their own products are so beautiful on their on their own. They should just call it what it is. Um, so instead of calling them a brandy or cognac, we got to really call Metaxa what it is, and that's just a specialty Greek liqueur. Um, in two in the year two thousand, it was purchased by Remy Quantro, so it is no longer owned. Um, uh, it's not no longer a Greek owned company, but it's still based in Greece, distilled in Greece, and has an all-Greek team. Uh, and like I mentioned earlier, how Metoxa uh, started by aging their brandies in limousine casks, uh, and that brought popularity to using those types of barrels. Uh, so, so how is it? Sorry, mm -hmm. just to go back. So it is, the base brandy is made from local grapes? Yes. Yeah, so exactly. You're only using local Greek grapes, like Savatiano, Saltinia, or Corinth grapes. Um, so those grapes are very, they're, they're white grapes, they're, they're pretty crisp, they're not as aromatic as some of the other tiporos like we've talked about. So here it's like a very kind of base grape that is meant to take on the flavors of the barrels and the aromatics. It's like a good foundation grape. Kind of like, you know, if you're making a, a cognac or armagnac, they use Umni Blanc, which doesn't have, you know, it's not a particularly super aromatic grape. It's more of a grape to be a blank canvas to really take on the flavor of the aging, as well as in this case, in the case of Metaxa, the flavors of the botanicals that they use. Yeah, but mm. they're only using Greek varieties. Here. Cool. And how old is the the Grand Fine? That one is, I believe, it's about fifteen or plus. Yeah, I have a I have an old bottle here. They don't say. I'm going to show you. I'm going to show you real quick. Uh, my screen. Uh, here's like an old bottle of the Grand Fine. There's really cool cer ceramic bottles. Uh, it doesn't say exactly the age, but I believe it's 15 and plus. I think it depends on each year. Fantastic. And I, I mean, I'll admit, I always thought Metaxa was Greek brandy. Uh, I mean, it, but... it, it, it has similarities to Greek brandy, but you know, it's you can't call brandy if you're if you're putting um, botanicals and and sweetening it with wine. So it's it's more than a brandy. That's what I'm trying to get at. Um, and they don't they no longer say brandy on the labels it's calling it a greek specialty spirit um, but is, I think that's that's, important, it's an important differentiator to, to throw in there so is metaxa a category or is it a brand it's a brand 
It's a right. brand, but it's a, also a category because there's nothing else like it in the whole world. So okay. yes, it is a brand. It's it, and it doesn't really fit into the brandy category 100%, right? It's 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 kind of lumped into brandies, but it, it is different. You know, there's no other brandies that they add botanicals and and add a wine as a sweetener. So it's in the brandy family, but I think it's a subset of, in its own category. Indeed, but nobody else is making. Metaxa in the way that other people are making Fairnet, for example. No, not that okay. I'm aware of. Yeah. Okay. Cool. All right. Uh, and somebody asked just to, for you to clarify, limousine. What is a limousine cask? Uh, it's a it's a type of uh, type of wood. French oak or something, isn't it? Yeah. Cool. All right. Sorry. That's great. Thank you. Um, so, how is Metaxa consumed? Um, you know, again, and classically in Greece, it's an after dinner drink, you know, snifter glass, kind of how you would drink a cognac. Um, but I've had a lot of success mixing it with cocktails. Um, any any cocktail that where you would add um, a, a brown spirit, like a rum, brandy, or, or bourbon, I'd suggest trying it with a little metoxa. And since it does have a little bit of sweeteners, it's kind of cool to experiment with it. You could use it as both a modifier or as a base spirit. Um, at Osea, we had a really great cocktail where it was, it was both rye Metoxa, Racomolo, and sweet vermouth, so kind of like a Greek riff on a Manhattan, and it worked really, really well because you get a little bit of the sweetness from the Metoxa, so you could use a little bit less vermouth, um, so it creates a really nice experience. Definitely recommend trying it out, either neat or in a cocktail. Cool. All right, um, I'm just going to kind of continue in the interest of time. Um, oh. One important thing to discuss oh, is... You seem to be on a Uzo screen. It's still on a Uzo screen? Hold on. Yeah, if anybody else is saying that. Uh, hold on one second. Yeah, that's all right. Sorry, one moment. I'm having troubles uh, here. No, that's fine. Technology and Uzo at uh <laughs> Do you see anything right now? I don't even see my own presentation. I can see your screen at the moment. I had a presentation. This, folks. Uh, it's fine. You, you go on with that. I had a presentation once in uh, BCB Berlin in front of 300 people where my computer froze. Uh, <laughs> One minute into it, I had to reboot the computer and hope that it was going to uh, go back and work as normal. So that's not quite as bad as the time my battery ran out and I had no power at all in a presentation I'd never run before and had no idea. Right, I'm what trying to something different here. Should I just continue without the presentation? Yeah, continue without the presentation. If it pops up again, I'll let you know. Okay. So, yeah. so it's just see me now, right? Yeah. Okay, well, there's worse things to see, right? <laughs> um, okay, so I want to talk about now um, the. Let me just try one last thing. So, Greek liqueurs in general are an important category of spirits. Um, so, traditionally, people would be making liqueurs at home, uh, things like. La Racomolo, which is a very popular Greek liqueur, Tentura, uh, or just making fruit liqueurs in their in their homes. Um, so Racomolo is the first spirit I wanted to talk about. Um, I had a couple great slides here, um, but we'll try to go without it. Um, I'm just trying to fix it while I can. Oh man. My IT guy would say reboot the machine, but we don't want you to do that. <laughs> I, I, I completely lost. The whole thing there. Okay, show my screen. It's telling me it's loading Johnny Labrador's screen. There we go. There oh. we go. Sorry about that, everybody. You can see me now? You yeah. can see the screen? Been, yeah. Okay, sorry about that. All right, so Racomolo. So Racomolo is one of my favorite Greek liqueurs. Um, the name Racomelo, which is basically a derivative of two words, Raki which is the Cretan word for tsipro, and melo, which is a Greek word for honey. So basically, it's a combination of tsipro and honey. And that's racomolo in its most basic sense. They usually add a bunch of different spices, mainly Kalon cinnamon, which is the most classic. 
And historically, this was something that was typically homemade. Um, you could have it warm or have it cold, and it was a lot of times considered Yaya's cough medicine or, um, or, the, or Greek cough medicine. So historically, like I said, it's homemade, but now there's starting to be some brands out there that are, are making it really great uh, racomolos. Um, it's sweetened only with honey. There's no other sugar added. You have the, the cinnamon and other spices mixed in, so it's really delicious. Uh, in Greece, it's something that's very popular in the winter because in Greece, it does. The, Greece has winters; it does get cold there, so they'll heat it up um, uh, either on a stove top or with a cappuccino steam wand and 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 heat it up and have it warm. And it's it's like a cocktail in itself. You don't have to add anything else to it. Um, so you could use it in cocktails. You could have it neat, heated up. Um, there aren't too many commercial producers of roots uh, of uh, Racomolo. Roots is kind of the, one of the main ones out there right now. They produce a bunch of different Greek liqueur, liqueurs. Uh, and grandmas and grandpas all over Greece are the ones who are making this. Um, I've probably had more Racomolo in my life has been homemade versus actually bought, store bought. Uh, and it's something that you could easily make in your own bars or at home. Sometimes what they would do is drink half a bottle of Tsiporo, then fill it up with like the local Greek honey, throw in a cinnamon stick, and that's it. Let it sit for a few weeks, and you have Racomolo. Um, I love use. I love to mix it in cocktails with uh, brown spirits. Um, works really well on a hot toddy. Um, it's so such a versatile flavor because honey, cinnamon are such comforting and warm flavors that are universal, not just to Greek cuisine. And you could use them in a lot of different ways. Is it available commercially in the U.S.? Yeah. So uh, the only brand that I'm aware of is Roots, and they are in the U.S. They're they're in Europe as well. Uh, it's a young team behind that brand. Um, they have these cool square bottles. Um, they're, they're, they do a really good job with this. Yeah, it's traditionally from Crete, so they're using like a, a family Cretan recipe for this one. Cool. And you mentioned Yaya's uh, cough medicine. Yeah, Yaya's are, uh, Yaya is the Greek word for grandma. <laughs> so okay. you know, there's definitely if you have a cold, you know, grandmas always have these these. Uh, remedies that heal lots of different things. So it's not uncommon to have a, uh, I eat my yaya, give me a little bit of racomolo if I'm starting to feel a little hail or have a sore throat. You gotta love grandmothers. Yep. Uh, the next liqueur I want to mention is Tentura. Um, we'll kind of briefly talk about this one. Um, Tentura is, comes from the Italian word tintura, which means tincture. Um, it's an iconic liqueur that was produced in the Greek city of Patra since the 1500s. Um, basically, Patras is one of the key port cities in Greece. So at, during the spice trades, it was they would kind of dock in Patras, and there was such an abundance of spices available there. Um, and they would just use lots of different stuff, like maybe ginger, cloves, cinnamon. There's a lot of different recipes for making tentura. Um, you mainly see it also homemade, but there's a few, a few good producers out there. Uh, Verino is the one I have in the picture in the bottom left. They do a really nice job. Um, in comparison to Racomolo, this is going to be a much more bolder cinnamon expression. I kind of like calling it, I mean this in the best way possible, but like Greek fireball, because it has that strong cinnamon aspect, which almost burns your tongue because it's such strong, like big red gum. Um, but it's delicious. And especially if you mix it in with a little bit of coffee, it's a, it's a nice uh, coffee drink, or even sometimes with espresso are great. Um, this is a cocktail I made once. Called, I called it the uh, cold brew corrected. Uh, I did two ounces of cold brew. Uh, I did about a half ounce of tentura, half ounce simple syrup, a little bit of cream, and then I used uh, Torres brandy. Just built it in the glass, shaved some cinnamon on top. It was fantastic. Cool. Alrighty, I'm kind of running out of time here, so I just wanted to touch upon a few more things. Um, what I love about Greece right now is that it's going through what we like to call the post-crisis Greek Renaissance. So in 2008, you know, the world had a crisis, right? But Greece felt it pretty badly. Um, you know, a lot of Greeks were leaving Greece, moving to other parts of Europe to experiment and try new things, leaving their family businesses. But Greece is a hard country to stay away from for that long. So a lot of people then went back to their homes in Greece because, you know, you can't resist the beautiful weather, scenery, and culture of Greece. But they started to take a little bit of uh, a global culture and uh, and worldview and apply it to their own cocktails, their own restaurants and bars. And you're seeing what they like to say, you know, from crisis comes creativity. You're seeing some of the best bars in Greece right now, especially in Athens. Um, these are two bars that I have down below, Baba Aram and Clumsies, which have been the, the 50 best list for the past, I don't even know how many years. Uh, Clumsies is in the top 10 um, the last few years in a row. Um, 
from also from creativity. There's like a bunch of new stuff. So while people have been focusing on, uh, while we've been mainly focusing on traditional spirits, I'd like to talk about the new stuff right now. So the team behind the Clumsies, they've actually started their own line of fantastic sodas called Three Cents. I have a picture of those below. Using all indigenous, uh, they use a lot of Greek herbs, botanicals to flavor their sodas, like Greek pink grapefruit here, the pink grapefruit soda, the Aegean tonic, which is being made with Greek herbs and cucumber. Um, and then Greek spirits, so again, there's also a craft revolution happening behind Greek spirits. Um, I have a picture here of a new gin on the market. This is actually something that I, I've, uh, I've launched myself. It's called Stray Dog Wild Gin. So I just want to take a moment to just talk to you a little bit about something new that's going on. Um, so Stray Dog Wild Gin, we just launched actually in February here in, in the States. Um, so it's being distilled with all different Greek botanicals. Uh, we have wild mountain sage, or in Greek called Foscomilo. Bay leaf, rosemary, fennel seed, and mastica resin is inside there as well. Also using Mediterranean lemon and orange peel, cardamom, of course, juniper, coriander. And we're going for a very herbal, more savory expression uh, of a gin. Uh, something that, I, that tries to capture the essence of what it is to be Greek and Greek flavor and capturing it into a bottle. Um, so I just wanted to share that with you all. That's something we've, we've so proud of that we launched recently. Um, it's kind of a weird time to launch a new product right now, um, but I hope you all will be able to get to try it sometime soon. Um, we're currently in New York, New Jersey, Connecticut, and hopefully launching to other parts of uh, the country soon. Um, okay, and that's pretty much all I had to talk about today. Here's a here's a, f a funny guy, a funny Greek guy making some lamb to end it all. Um, but if you all have any questions, I, I would love to take some time to to answer you all, all your questions about Greek spirits. Um, Greek gin, Greek liqueurs, Greece in general. Um, yeah. so a couple of quick, couple of quick questions. Uh, you mentioned raki and arak, and yeah. I mean, I I know that's a a general term. I think arak actually means sweat from sort of the idea of distillation. Mm -hmm. uh, are they interchangeable? I mean, is sipuru raki? So what? they're not always interchangeable. It depends which country you're talking about. So. Um, Tsipuro and Raki are interchangeable, but Raki is what they Raki is what they call Tsipuro from the island of Crete. So if you're if you were talking about Cretan uh, Tsipuro, you're gonna call either Raki or Tsikudia. But they also call uh, Raki. Raki is a another spirit in Turkey, and I think other parts of of um, the, yeah. the Middle East or that part of the world, um, Raki could be, mean an anise-based spirit. So oh. like Turkish Raki is more similar to like Lebanese Arak, which is more similar to Uzo, whereas Raki from Crete doesn't have anise in it. It's more just grape-based. So it's confusing because a lot of different countries use the same word for different things. Like even the word mastika in Bulgaria is it's it's actually something that's more like ouzo. So there's been a little bit of confusion over time, and I think that has to do with the fact that one thing I forgot to mention about mastica is um, since mastica became so expensive, like the resin itself, it became a difficult thing to work with. So pe that's kind of what pushed people to use anise more in distilling. So because they couldn't afford to use the mastica anymore, they started to use anise in their liqueurs. So they then they still just called it mastica, even though it wasn't made with mastica anymore in other parts of the world. So yeah, yeah. There, there's some words that could be a little bit confusing depending on which country you're talking about. Indeed. Uh, where in Greece do you make the gin? Oh, so stray dog gin comes from the northern part of Greece in a mountainous region called Aridea. So it's all the way up in the northern part of Greece. Um, we have a fantastic distiller. His name is Dimitri. Um, the distillery is called Melisanidis Distillery up in the north. Um, where it's a really unique climate, a really unique area where there's a lot of herbs that grow wild in the mountains. Uh, and that was kind of the inspiration behind creating this product because there's an abundance of flavorful ingredients all throughout Greece, especially in the mountainous regions. And Greece is like, you know, a lot of people when they think of Greece, they think of the beaches, they think of the coastlines, but it's a, it's a country that is fairly mountainous. I think the majority of the country is covered in mountains. And with those mountains, you get unique terroir, either when it's for growing wine growing grapes or even with growing herbs and produce and vegetables. Okay. Uh, the, obviously, a lot of these spirits are traditional spirits and liqueurs. Mm -hmm. uh, are craft distillers there using these as 
you know, a jumping off point or are they, you know, making lots more gins and, you know, trying to copy other things? Well, it's, it depends. I think a lot of them are using the traditional recipes. Um, but the whole, I feel the main goal for Greek distillers and Greek people in general is trying to take Greek spirits to that next level of acceptance and of appreciation within the world. So with, there's a, I mentioned a Tsipura before, Opurist. So the owners of that particular brand are actually 10 bartenders in Greece. And their whole goal was to make a Tsipura that is perfect for mixing in cocktails. Um, so you're seeing kind of a mixture of people that are going to take, take traditional ingredients and, and liqueurs and spirits, but trying to apply a newer techniques or a new botanicals to make it approachable for a global customer and a global consumer. Um, but then again, you still have the small producers that are producing it the way that they've been making it for generations and generations and generations. So you have both sides of the spectrum. I'd say the bulk of all the products is definitely going to be more on the traditional side. And then some of these new distillers, maybe the younger ones, or the, the next generation, they're the ones who are going to take a little bit more risks and start to experiment with newer products to try to branch out. Cool. But I mean, are there more Greek gins waiting to be unleashed on the market? There are, at the moment, there that I know of, there are only two other Greek gins. Uh, there's one called Three Grace, which just came onto the to to the market, uh, and then there's one or two in Greece that aren't really exported outside of Greece. So we're one of the first ones outside of Greece to be producing a gin. Um, and then within Greece, I mean, I I feel like they they should be making more because it's such a it's a country that is so rich in botanicals and flavor. And that's what our goal was to capture that, capture that essence of Greece flavor. Um, because, you know, in terms of the distilling history, like I mentioned before, making ouzo is a very, very similar process. It all starts off with, you know, neutral spirit and raw, amazing botanicals. So we try to find a way to take, take the two things and combine it, but create a new recipe that's, you know, easier to work in cocktails. Like ouzo, you can't, it's so hard to mix in a drink. It's something you just have to drink on its own. Um, we wanted to kind of create something that is something robust and flavorful, but still essence of Greece. Fantastic. Uh, Johnny, uh, that's all we have time for today. Is the clock tolling in the background for me, etc. Uh, <laughs> thank you so much. Uh, thank you to the 100 people or so that have attended this session. Uh, I feel very privileged. I feel I've almost had a session just on my own. Uh, I wish I'd been tasting alongside, but still. Uh, I I you too. <laughs> indeed. Well, we'll do it at some stage. So just as a reminder, we will be sending out a recording of this webinar tomorrow. And if you didn't get a chance to answer your questions, we'll make sure that we try to follow up with you individually. Johnny, thank you for your time. Attendees, thank you. Thank again. you, everybody. And yeah, we will see you next Monday at four o'clock. Cheers, Johnny. Cheers. <laughs>